Preparedness matters. We can do it. We're in this together, and this course will show how. Okay, preparedness and prepping, are they actually one and the same thing? Rating from 1 to 10, how would you rank your overall level of preparedness for an event on the scale of the flood in Grand Forks? 8, maybe 9 out of 10. Let's say that a 10 is been there, done that, have a complete plan, and I'm ready to go. Hope I never have to, but I'm ready. And let's say a 1 is, what's preparedness? Again, what is preparedness? Is it preparing physically, spiritually, emotionally? Is it relocation? Is it stocking up on stuff? Is it all of them or some of them? What actually is it? It's going to be very individual. How would you rank your school, your workplace, your house of worship, your recreation center, or other important institutions for their preparedness? Say five to six out of ten. You need the local network to be pretty resilient. It's okay having a great house and being all stocked up and everything else. If your entire neighbor and all your support services are destroyed, you're going to be in a lot of trouble quite quickly, however well you've individually prepared. What led you to the rankings you selected? Take a minute and think about that because I think it's really important for us to get a sense of where the baseline is for getting ready for disasters and crises. Life experiences, uh, work experiences, and generally being very interested in prepping and preparedness. Again, I'm not really the target audience here. It's the people who aren't prepared that need to be watching this sort of video and doing this sort of a course. What were your rankings? Let me say this. If you're average, they would be low. There's no shame in that. Public surveys indicate that's the norm, with many persons never having engaged in any preparedness activities at all. So are we abnormal because we're preppers? Well, I bet the people of Abbotsford in uh, British Columbia right now are actually really hoping and wishing that they had prepped and prepped a lot more than they had prepped if they have already prepped. Prepping is something that when you need it is a complete vital thing to have done. But unless you need it, what's the point? In fact, most people haven't even participated in sessions to help them think about being prepared. So congratulations, you're in the upper tier just by watching these lectures. Cool. However, the sad truth is most people are prepped by watching The Walking Dead. And God's help us all if that's what they use to actually deal with a major event. In its 2017 National Preparedness Report, FEMA identified the following as a challenge, which I'm quoting. Inspiring individuals to prepare for emergencies. Inspiring. FEMA also used words like motivating, empowering. This is personal. A general request of the public or telling others, this is good for you, that's not going to cut it. We have to reach people where they are in order to get prepared. I don't know about you, but when I hear inspiring, motivating, empowering, it makes me quite nauseated. I'm not Generation X, and I think this whole collaboration and giving people gold stars to get them to do stuff that's in their own interest is a bit pointless. But it is generational, and I'm an old guy now, and I get it. But realistically speaking, what actually motivates you to prep? And it is mostly fear. FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security and various other national and international organizations, including the World Health Organization, regularly have lots of information out there that is absolutely useful to you as a prepper in the event of an SHTF in your area. A whole bunch of stuff. Access it. Some people will not even look at FEMA sites because it's, they don't like FEMA. Look at it. There's some stuff there that we find very useful. See, with him here, I agree with him and I disagree with him. I do think that the government has a role in getting stuff in place and getting training in place and getting people prepared in place rather than just throwing it all onto the individual to get prepped. The individual needs to get prepped, but the government needs to do most of the heavy lifting. It costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time, and it's buying now in case of something that might happen. It's a form of insurance and the government needs to ensure it can protect and look after its population in an SHTF event. Obviously, I'm not belittling the role of the individual here at all, but I don't think you can just throw it all onto the individual, nor do I think that's effective. I don't want to suggest that the general lack of preparedness is anyone's fault. It's really not. I blame YouTube for not making my channel a hundred million subscriber channel and then everybody watching it would be prepped. You know, this whole focus on disasters is actually fairly recent historically speaking. Let me tell you about another flood. It was known as the big one, the Mississippi River Flood of 1927. It's estimated that at least 637,000 persons were left homeless. But let's compare the reaction. 
The government response was ad hoc, with volunteers and charitable groups expected to provide any recovery assistance that was necessary. In fact, when contemplating how to get sufficient funds to help those who were affected, Secretary of War Dwight Davis recommended that President Calvin Coolidge issue a call to the nation to donate, out of everyone's own kindness, $5 million to be coordinated through the Red Cross. Okay, so volunteers still helped out and people did donate money. But now consider this. President Coolidge himself resisted calls to convene a special session of Congress that could allocate public funds. President Coolidge refused to visit the flood zone in spite of calls to do so for the attention it would bring to fundraising. Well, Coolidge isn't getting a good press here. However, if you throw everything onto the free market, and that tends to be one of the political strains of thought that has been around for a long, long time. One of the things with that, the major problem with that, is that it works if the markets are intact, if the markets fail, if there is no market because of flooding or economic changes, free market cannot pull itself out by its bootstraps and fix itself. It can't do it, except without enormous costs of life and death, whereas a government on those occasions can. Why? Because disasters weren't the government's business. And if they weren't the government's business, there was no one around to provide support, to help identify what the public should do, to help say, let's get ready. Okay, I'm trying to avoid politics here. I am a democratic socialist, sorry. But in my opinion, it's my opinion, I don't think there's anything any government does that's more important than protecting its citizens from adverse events and improving the citizens' quality of life. Those two things should go hand in hand. I really do think that. I do think it's up to the government to actually prepare to protect me and my loved ones in the event of a nuclear war or in the event of a hurricane or in the event of a drought. I do think so. I think it's their job. I think they get well, well paid to do that job, not to do all the other stuff they do, but that's their critical function to improve most of their citizens' quality of life. During the Cold War, in which U.S. tensions with the Soviet Union led many to fear nuclear war, there was an emphasis on getting the public prepared. Maybe you saw it. Who remembers Bert the Turtle showing a generation how to duck and cover under school desks for protection? Or those three upside-down triangles in a circle designating a public fallout shelter, which was usually nothing more than an accessible basement of a building. This was actually an important development because it took preparedness to the public, encouraging them to get involved. However, the focus was squarely on preventing injury and developing plans for a nuclear attack, and not much else. Very good, but what about after? That was always the big question to me when I was studying in the 80s um, civil defense in the United Kingdom from a nuclear war and participating in a whole bunch of stuff. What I want to know is what happens afterwards. And what happens afterwards is pretty gruesome if you look at nuclear war as a specific on a world scale. But civil defense was useful and should have been continued. And we really are long, long overdue now for civil defense for climate change emergencies all across our great nation of Canada and the, I would argue, United States. There are areas of Canada that have tsunami preps in place, like metal cans that are sealed, ready to be opened up after the tsunami to help the survivors with food and water in the initial phase when everything's been wiped out, if they survive. But we need more of that. We need a lot more of that. And I think Abbotsford's definitely going to show people that after the summer we had in Canada, the individuals have to prep, but the governments have to get their finger out You've already heard me mention FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and you'll hear it more because they play such an important role in guiding preparedness efforts. But as an agency, FEMA has had its ups and downs. It's been reorganized a number of times, and it's really post-September 11th, 2001, and post-Hurricane Katrina, which hit New Orleans and the Gulf Coast in 2005, that FEMA's preparedness efforts have been the most impactful. It's hard for me to disagree with that analysis. I mean, it's better than nothing. FEMA is better than nothing. And is it perfect? No. And should it be much better than it is? Yes. But it's still better than nothing. The problem in this course, and the problem generally with emergency preparedness, is that they actually look local and regional, and they look for short-term and sudden. Whereas we know, as preppers, that a lot of SHGFs could be national, transnational, and of long, long duration. Nobody's really prepping for that on a government level, or at least they're not prepping for me on a government level. I'm sure they've got well-stocked bunkers somewhere or other in Ottawa. 
But here's the point. There just hasn't been that much public attention to preparedness until recently. But I don't think that fully explains what we see as a lack of attention to the subject. Why do you think prepping is ignored by most people? I have my reasons. I've said them before. I'm not going to say them again now. What do you think? Why do people go glassy-eyed when you try and talk about prepping at a family barbecue? Why? Douglas Patton is a professor at the University of Tasmania in Australia. And he developed a theoretical model that helps to explain why. I'm just going to hit some highlights from the model. But to do so, I'm going to ask you some more questions. The answers people give tend to predict their levels of preparedness. Almost everybody doing this course are going to be at the high level of emergency preparedness or wanting to get to a high level of emergency preparedness. The problem is that most people who are at a low level of emergency preparedness should be watching the course, but are not. Do you know the hazards that surround you on a regular basis? Yes. If you answered yes, you're more likely to be prepared. But let's think about this. How often does the average person think about disaster situations? And I'm not talking about the brief coverage on the news in between the latest political scandal and sports score. Really, more people don't think about disasters because, well, it's not the pressing topic for them. As that on YouTube says, it's not SHTF until it actually happens to you. Which is actually a terrible indictment of people's imagination and empathy but we'll leave that aside. Not when childcare and aging parents, tax returns and health insurance, what's going on at work, looking at that cruise for next winter, and all of what makes up our lives takes our more immediate attention. The immediate always overwhelms you without planning and preparedness. You have to be able to think forward. You have to be able to sacrifice now in case of future events. It's a real shame that people, generally speaking as a mass, aren't very good at that. Do you have any level of anxiety or worry about disasters? We. Oui. If you answered yes, then you may actually be less likely to be prepared. Surprised? Don't be. What do we do with situations that cause anxiety? Get rid of them. Avoid them. Certainly not dwell on them. Having fear can actually make us motivated to just dismiss the whole thing when it comes to looking at preparedness activities. Oh no. Depends, really. I mean, for me, fear of abrupt climate change, which I started to study in detail, definitively made me think, made me act, and made me prep. Um, there's no question about that in my mind. It was fear-based because I saw the future, I thought, and it frightened me. And I keep seeing that future enrolling as I figured it would enroll about eight, nine years ago, and it still scares me, so I'm still prepping. Do you think that preparedness can actually make a difference. Absolutely. The Titanic had way more lifeboats and better lifeboats, there would have been over a thousand people who didn't drown for no apparent reason, other than the lack of emergency preparedness in detail. If not, why would you do it? Some take a fatalistic attitude thinking, I don't need to worry about it because if a hurricane hits, what can I do anyway? Others may think, what do I need to do when the first responders, police, fire, and EMS, are going to come to help me? The less persons think what they do matters, the less likely they are to do it, and this holds true for preparedness. Now this holds true for many, many things. This is why the new mainstream climate movement detests people like me, because I'm an eco-doomer. I think our society cannot survive the upcoming challenges on our water and our food supply. I just don't think we can, as a society as we're currently constituted, make a green deal, do a transition, be okay. I just don't buy it. But that doesn't stop me from acting in a green way. That doesn't stop me from doing things to mitigate it anyway, because it makes me feel better and it also helps prepare me where I live to actually deal with what I see coming. So I don't necessarily agree. I think that's a bit of a glib way of saying that, you know what, if you just dismiss there's any chance of survival, you won't make any preps for it. I don't necessarily agree with that. I do think it's situational. So you're here because you want to learn about preparedness. Again, that puts you in the lead. Throughout this course, we're going to tackle each of the questions I just asked, thinking together about what lessons we can draw for disaster preparedness and resilience. We're going to face the hazards that are out there and learn their realities. We're going to look at solutions that can be effective, as case study examples will show. We're going to look at how first responders approach preparedness and what we can learn from them. We're going to think about what happens after the disaster is over. All of this will hopefully reduce worry, 
and lead to that inspiration, motivation, and empowerment that FEMA hopes to see guiding public preparedness. Leaving aside the Generation X babble at the end of that clip, those questions are very good questions to ask yourself while you are watching other people's YouTube channels on preparedness or emergency preparing or on prepping. Do they actually routinely cover those major areas? Because if they don't, what are they covering and why are they covering it and why are you watching it? These are all good questions. You need to analyze often the information you're getting. Remember that Grand Forks got through a calamitous flood and came back stronger and more resilient. That's preparedness. Yes, but I would point out to you that the Incas and the Mayans, the Mongol Empire and the Roman Empire all fell and they fell disastrously and almost was eradicated in certain cases like the Roman and the Mongol empires. Yes, prepping can work, it can mitigate and prevent failure, but no failure can be absolutely guaranteed. It's still worth, in my opinion, prepping to be comfortable before you have to die in an emergency situation rather than just having nothing and suffering and dying. But that's just me. I want to help give healthcare and education to people around me for as long as I can. And if I can do that, then I'll do that. I think there's no time like the present to start preparing. So let's do just that. We'll begin by drawing upon the ready.gov website, an excellent resource that should be one of your first preparedness bookmarks. When thinking about planning, ready.gov identifies four questions as the first to be answered in the planning process. Yeah, I really agree with this. Uh, start now or restart prepping now. All those channels out there that last year and the year before put out videos saying it's too late to start prepping now, you're doomed, and you're not as smart as me. They're about ego, they're about inflating themselves. They're not about helping anybody. It's just about convincing themselves often from a place of major, major denial that they're actually special and will survive. And I'm not altogether sure why anybody watches them, but they're still there and they're actually fairly popular. However, time is pressing, so get prepped now. And do use ready.gov and other sites like that to get major information if you don't know what you're doing. Don't rely on YouTube channels or specific YouTube channels. They cover things in an odd way. YouTube channels for prepping are useful for specific information on specific issues that you arise from your reading and your research outside of social media. Preparedness is very personal because each individual has his or her own unique set of circumstances set in a specific geographic place with unique needs. For that reason, I can't give a one-size-fits-all answer for preparedness and I can't answer each of these questions for you. What I can do is explain the importance of thinking through these questions, offer insights that will hopefully be of value as you determine your own answers, and continue to be a guide in your preparedness journey throughout this course. It's very true this. I mean, everything's very localized and regionalized and stuff like that. But there is major common grounds and major common areas of emergency preparedness and prepping that we should all think about. And we all know what they are. You can call them the rule of nine, the rule of seven, the rule of 15, whatever you want to call it. There's certain core areas you want to take care of so you have a period of time where you don't have to deal with the event itself directly because you have prepped. So you have water, you have food, you have shelter, you have medical, you have communications, you have fire starting, you have fishing, you have whatever it is, but you have made preps to deal with the immediate aftermath of the event. And hopefully, if you get time, is actually make preps to deal with rebuilding society in your area after the event. How will you receive emergency alerts and warnings? I have an emergency weather radio, I have my internet, and I have maybe word of mouth if I hear, see anybody on the street. It's not that busy a street. People might phone me or send me an email, I don't know. Get it from YouTube, I guess. Who knows? I also look at the sky. And I also look at the trees and I look at the birds. I'm trying to get very attuned to the new area I'm in so I can sense if they feel something's coming. Because nature is very, very smart at actually forecasting SHTF events before they happen in some cases. We need to know when to implement our emergency plans to take action if possible before the danger arrives. Absolutely. I evacuate from a hurricane or a wildfire before everybody else does, and you'll find it probably easy. Evacuate when everybody else does, it's going to be hard. Information can also be provided through the older emergency alert system, which includes announcements on television and radio. But you should also be sure to check with your local government, your city, your county, or your town, 
to see if they have their own emergency alert system. Yeah, it's a good idea. I actually have no working cell phone here and nor do I have any working TV here. I'm just using DVDs and uploading this sort of thing to a hard drive in the hopes that I can get to civilization in the next week or two, and it may be longer, and upload it. But that's an excellent idea. I haven't actually thought to look at that. And I will look at that in the next week or two with the local council and I will talk to them. I actually will talk to them actually about seeing if they have a role for me voluntarily in the emergency planning department. A very small community, very rural. I have a bunch of experience in that. Maybe they can use me. But at the same time, maybe they do have a text alert system for locals. If they do, it'd be useful to have it. If only to tell me what roads are flooded in my own area. Many jurisdictions do in the form of an opt-in system where you provide your contact information and then they push out messages as needed. Are you comfortable with that? I am, but it really depends where you live. Institutions like universities, school systems, hospitals, and even some businesses may have their own personalized systems as well. Each of these systems may provide unique information, so all are important. True that. In my experience working in a hospital and working in a university, I find that sort of emergency alert system is actually a bit, a bit useless, to be honest with you. Uh, I think find local talk radio is really great uh, for local events that are happening. But if they're available to you, sign up for them. Why not? What is your shelter plan? What if you had to evacuate, as in the Grand Forks flood? Where would you go? Hotel, hotel, family, friends. It depends. Hopefully I don't have to bug out from here. But I have plans to, in case I have to. One should never be complacent. Your answer would likely depend on how far you had to evacuate, whether it was a few blocks being relocated due to a small hazmat spill just for a day or two, or an entire town being relocated for multiple days or weeks due to a catastrophic incident. In theory, I can go to the United Kingdom, but Kitty can't, so I'm not actually going to do that as an escape route. And it's quite likely that whatever's going on here would also be going on there, but not always. If you have the ability to move to a new nation because of passport or birth, make sure you keep it up to date. Make sure you keep your documents up to date. It's always worth having a bolt hole that's way outside what you'd want to do. In evacuations, local governments or nonprofit organizations like the Red Cross often open public shelters. Shelters may also be open for weather extremes, such as heat waves and extreme cold temperatures. It's not a great option, this, and if you have nothing else, I think it's a good option, but it's not something I personally plan to do for a wide variety of reasons. I do think in an ongoing massive transnational SHCF event, to find yourself in a government-run shelter might help for a little while, but really, really, it's, you've got other things you should be doing outside of officialdom as officialdom contracts and dies. Separate you from your pet, holding pets in one location and people in another. Again, better to consider now than when in the process of evacuating. Totally not an option for us. Wolfie is our child and that's how we treat him and that's how we are going to treat him in SHDF. However, I have made various plans and considerations for Kitty's elderly parents. Currently, for most events, they're going to be pretty well protected for a period of a few days. But that's about it. In an ongoing massive event, we need to fetch them and evacuate them. And I would plan on doing that very early on, rather than later on when things start to fail. What routes will you use to evacuate? Evacuations can be called for many reasons. Floods, hazardous materials, nuclear plant accidents, tsunamis, wildfires, for landslides or sinkholes, and much more. The route that you take out of town matters. Some streets may not be passable, others may. Know your location very well, have a car with gasoline, have a bicycle that works and you can ride it, have good footwear that you can use to walk out of wherever you need to go to get to wherever you need to go in an SHCF event. Don't rely on any specific mode of transport, do not fall into that trap. Have paper maps and compasses that you can use to navigate that you have used before and know how to use. Do not rely on GPS, do not rely on cell phones. And as I said earlier, if your plan is stay at home like mine is, still plan to evacuate, even a small distance. The house could burn down, could be a whole bunch of issues. You need to make sure you have evacuation plans to bug out, if you, even if you plan not to bug out. If you plan to bug out, the, the reverse is also true. Have stay at home stuff as well. I packed everything up and sent it up north and we lost heat in the house for 24 hours. Generally, four months before that wouldn't have been a big problem. It was a bit of a problem that time because I had sent everything I had in case of heat loss in the house 
here. That river could block a road by flooding. That railroad track or interstate could be where the hazmat release is. That road with big trees could be blocked if they fell in a storm. A quick list of alternate routes is something that you can store on your smartphone or keep in writing with other essentials that you would take if evacuating. And that could make the difference between a safe, effective evacuation and feeling lost if your preferred route is inaccessible. Write it down, make copies, and give it to everybody you love and trust. Don't use a cell phone for this sort of stuff. Don't use an iPad. Don't use files on a computer. You can use them to print out documents, which are hard copy, and that's what you need to be doing. The dependency on technology is a dangerous thing given how new that technology is. What is your communication plan? This is one of the most important aspects as you're going to need a way to keep in touch with your friends and family and to coordinate with other members of your household if you're separated when a disaster occurs. Channel mode. Illegal with that ham radio. License, but uh, have a few of these. Preferably in a nice metal container. You can also get some of these. They're pretty cheap, and why not get them? They work not that far, but they work well enough in short duration. You can also get earpods and all the rest of it. You need to have a communications protocol, all that stuff. But that being said, what I have is agreed on strategy to go home or go to other places depending on what the emergency is. Kitty's well aware that if there's a light in the sky or several lights in the sky and the car's not working, that she needs to shelter in place using the car kits if she's too far from home. She also knows that to stay there for two weeks before coming home. She also knows that when she gets home, she needs to look in a specific place in the house where I would write down any instructions I had if I then had already left before she arrived. Having an idea of where to go is one of the critical functions that you can provide for your family who aren't pregnant. The answer that most people are tempted to give is, I'll just use my cell phone. 96% of the public has cell phones, at most recent count, so that sounds great. The problem is, during a disaster, it's very common. And in fact, first responders flat out expect this, for cell phone communications to be intermittent at best and unavailable at worst. <laughs> My cell phone has zero reception here, I'm looking into it. But yeah, it's useful, I forgot about that. I do have uh, Ontario alerts on my phone. This can be because cell phone towers are damaged, but it's just as likely, more so actually, that they're overloaded with call volume. Very true, right from the beginning, use text if you need to communicate. Uh, don't even try to make a voice phone call, just go straight to text. If the issue is big enough because it's a bomb blast or whatever it is, use text right from the beginning. and Don't expect it to work. You may also consider identifying a person outside of the immediate area, someone that everyone in your household knows as a contact who can serve as a communication broker, receiving and relaying messages. This is an excellent idea. Be sure that your contacts are updated in your phone. And you may consider developing text or chat groups for those that you would need to reach in an emergency. As I said, relying on a phone is risky. I did find a clip from Preparedness Veteran that I made some weeks ago, so... If, after a disaster, your phone is damaged beyond repair, and you wish to call someone to let them know you survived, you can't. Unless you have access to a pay phone or you can borrow someone else's phone. And even then you may not know the phone numbers of the person or people you want to call. Let's face it, not many people actually know their own phone numbers, let alone the phone number of someone else, or the embassy, or a hospital, and so on. I do know it! So for this scenario, an emergency card should be prepared and what I'm talking about is a little card with all the phone numbers of the key personnel or people you want to phone in case of an emergency preferably laminated or waterproofed I would also argue that you need to make multiple copies I would also argue you need to distribute them widely I would also argue that you need to have fresh photographs of both yourself and your loved ones with those sorts of information cards the event might be very very local to you and your family, it might be a kidnapping, and to have really good photographs is a good idea. Well, that's it for me in the wilds of central Ontario, uh, still waiting for an HVAC part and peg to arrive. The Tyler, we have found, we found Tyler, 
There may be tiling happening in the next few days. Who knows? However, the HVAC part and the peg, the uh, incident in British Columbia and Pacific Northwest this week, may well have put a large hold on us having proper heating and hot water in the house. It is what it is. We are going to mitigate. We are going to adapt. So it's going to be an interesting time here if we don't get heat functional by about January. It's going to get pretty cold. The wood fire works well, but it's not great in really, really cold conditions. Anyway, have a great week. Hug and kiss the ones you love. And from me in the wilds of Ontario and from Wolfie Terrier, have a great day and thank you very much for watching. If this passes muster in terms of viewership, if this passes muster in terms of uh, copyright, I will do the other chapters. This is the second video and the last video of the first chapter. There is information in this course that's well worth watching. If you can get it for $29.99 and, and it's not a huge amount of money to you and it might be, I'm aware of that, or you can get it from the library, uh, I would, yeah, I would say it's worth watching. I didn't really dislike it and I did find it a little bit superficial at times, but what do you expect, right? I'm prepping for climate change and nuclear war apocalypse, so it's not going to hit all my buttons, is it? It's going to tell me about the mundane things, like having emergency response from my local council that I could sign up to. No idea they did that. Going to find out. Wouldn't surprise me if they do. Doodles. This has been a Dog in a Bonnet production, 2021.